Class is now in session. I am Professor Hockey, and today we're discussing Game 77 of the regular season between the San Jose Sharks and the Colorado Avalanche, in which the Sharks have lost 4-3 to three in overtime. So the Sharks will not reach the coveted fourth win in a row here for the first time this season. It is not going to happen, but they came very, very close, and the Sharks should definitely be proud of the performance that they put on here tonight, especially considering all the adversity that they ended up facing in this particular game. Of course, just the fact that the Sharks are are a significantly worse team than the Colorado Avalanche, Colorado being the defending Stanley Cup champions, the San Jose Sharks being the fourth last place team who hasn't made the playoffs in multiple years now. On top of that, the last meeting, the only meeting between these two teams prior to this game, was a 6-0 dismantling at the hands of the Colorado Avalanche of the San Jose Sharks, probably one of their worst, if not their worst, games of the entire season. That is something that would likely be in a lot of the players, at least in the back of their minds. And then, of course, course, the beginning of this game, the Sharks fall behind 2-0 very early on, only about six minutes in, and they're already in the hole by two goals. And so that thought of the previous game that may have been in the back of some players' minds has likely moved its way forward in their brain at this point as they begin to believe that this game would end up going that same exact way. And yet, the Sharks, they respond to it, and instead of folding like they did all those weeks ago, they end up responding to it well enough. Now, it wouldn't come as a response, at least goal wise at the end of the first but the Sharks after being just heavily outplayed through the first few minutes and giving up those two goals actually ended up at least getting some shots on net which is more saying more than what they did in that previous game against the Avalanche and so while it was a 2-0 deficit at the end of the first it didn't have that same feeling of despair and helplessness as it did in that previous matchup however it is still a two goal deficit to the defending cup champions it is not going to be an easy lead to come back from while Kevin LeBanc would cut the lead in half with a goal for himself. McKinnon would restore the two-goal lead near the end of the second period, and so after 40 minutes, the Sharks would still be behind by two goals. And so if a two-goal deficit seemed, you know, difficult to come back from at the end of a first period, a two-goal deficit at the end of a second period would seem near insurmountable, and yet the Sharks, they get on their toes, and they managed to not only cut the lead in half once again with a goal from Jacob Peterson on the power play, but they actually tie this game up with a second goal of the game from Kevin LeBanc. And so that is more adversity faced. Two separate two goal deficits that the Sharks would eventually close the lead on. On top of that, it should be mentioned that at some point in the second period, Tomas Hurdle would exit the game. He would then return for about a couple of shifts, as well as including an unsportsmanlike call from the bench, but then he would not end up playing for the entirety of that third period. And so that is another piece of adversity faced from the San Jose Sharks. All the deficits, the injuries, just the general state of the Sharks versus the Avalanche coming into this game, and yet they'd still bring it to overtime. Now, in this overtime the Sharks had a couple of very, very good chances to win it. Kevin LeBanc had a great opportunity on a 2-on-0 to get a hat-trick game-winning goal here in overtime, which wouldn't end up happening. Steven Lorenz had a great opportunity, but eventually it would be a Nathan McKinnon breakaway, and he's not going to miss too many times from that particular situation, and so the Avalanche would get the extra point. Moving on to the standings here, the San Jose Sharks actually did get a bit of help over these past couple of days, while the Anna Ducks would stand pat at their 56 points due to their unfortunate loss to the Calgary Flames, I believe, yesterday, where they came into the third period up 4-3 and then would lose 5-4 in regulation. Both the Blue Jackets and the Blackhawks, the Blackhawks did it tonight, the Blue Jackets a couple of days ago, managed to win games, meaning they both bump up to a very similar 56 points. So now there is a three-way tie for for that last place spot. Meanwhile, the San Jose Sharks, who of course had won their three previous games, had kind of put themselves out of that race or close to out of that race for that last place spot. Though with the couple of wins for the Blue Jackets and the Blackhawks, it may have seemed possible. However, now with this overtime loss, the Sharks hit the 60-point mark, giving them a 4 point uh, lead over each of the other three teams behind them. And while this is only still two games compared to if the Sharks had won tonight, then it would be a three game difference with five point lead. The Sharks don't actually have the tiebreaker against either the Ducks or the Columbus Blue Jackets, at least at the moment, making it rather difficult even if the Ducks were to miraculously get four more points over these last five games. So the Sharks 
probably not going to fall much lower in the standings. However, and while I didn't include it on this board, there is a bit of worry that the Sharks could potentially pass the Montreal Canadiens. The Sharks are six points behind, which is a pretty difficult gap to climb, but the Sharks have been playing very well as of late, and the Canadians have been playing the opposite of very well as of late, completely garbage. They just keep getting absolutely stomped in each of their last few games. So while it is not necessarily going to happen and I don't foresee it happening it's not out of the realm of possibility and we'll probably need a decent update to that over these next couple of days moving on to the lineup here tonight there was a lineup that the Sharks came into this game with but pretty much immediately after these two goals were scored the Sharks began to shuffle the lines a bit and then especially once Tomas Hurdle went down with that injury the Sharks lines were in complete flux for pretty much the rest of the game so it was a bit difficult to talk about like actual line chemistry here tonight so we're mostly just going to be going through player by player basis so on the top line, it was supposed to be a Gushin Couture Bordelow line, but after those first couple of goals, Gushin got swapped back to the second line with Hurdle and Peterson while Gregor was moved up to that top line. But let us speak first and foremost about Daniil Gushin. Had a bit of a roller coaster last couple of days. He gets his first career goal in his first career NHL game against the Arizona Coyotes a couple of days ago, but with a couple players returning from injury, he ends up getting sent back down to the Barracuda on his emergency loan status, and he ends up playing a game with the Barracuda against the Coachella Valley Firebirds where he also scores a goal in that one. However, because Lindblom actually was not healthy enough to play tonight's game and they're going to wait to hold him out until Thursday, Gushin was called back up once more, played in tonight's game and actually played rather well. Ends up with an assist, a power play assist on the Jacob Peterson goal and I thought played yet another very solid game, had a couple of opportunities to even get another goal for himself and I'm very happy with how Gushin has looked. A player who, if you would ask me just maybe a couple of years ago, I probably wouldn't have even ranked in the top five prospects for the San Jose Sharks, but he has managed to build himself back up over these last couple of years, over this season, and now, you sh sure, you probably still have him below William Eklund, but do you have him now below Thomas Bordelow? You definitely could say that, but I feel as though it is significantly closer, and Gushin is likely the Sharks' third best forward prospect in the system currently besides maybe someone like Philip Bystedt who we don't necessarily have a great feel of just yet because of him playing overseas it's hard to necessarily deduce how well that will transfer over. When it comes to Bordelow on the other hand not really a great game for Bordelow for sure I thought he looked extremely awkward and uncomfortable out on the ice multiple times he was falling he was fumbling pucks tripping over himself it was definitely a bit difficult to watch for sure I thought he did still end up with like a couple of decent looks I guess but generally not the best game for Bordelow if I was going to give like a on 10 score it'd probably be like a 3.5 maybe a 4 if I was being rather generous and then when it comes to Logan Couture a couple of points for him ends up being the center here with multiple different wingers at times in this game and I thought he played decently well when it comes to the second line, like I mentioned, hard to really gauge Hurdle's performance in this game because of the injuries. When it came to Noah Gregor, though, another very good game for Noah Gregor. I was a bit surprised to see him promoted, not because I didn't think he deserved it. Obviously, a hat trick in his previous game deserves it. But I really enjoyed the line of Gregor, uh, Sturm, and LeBanc, so I didn't think those three would end up getting separated. But instead, he does indeed get rewarded with that promotion. Played a good amount in the top six for the San Jose Sharks here tonight, and I thought had a very good game. The other winger on this line was Jake. Jacob Peterson, who has been very good for the San Jose Sharks ever since he was called up. He was in that trade, the one-for-one -one deal for Scott Reedy with the Dallas Stars, and it is really paying off for the San Jose Sharks at this point. And it kind of is reminiscent a bit to the trade that the Sharks made a couple of years ago with the Toronto Maple Leafs when they sent Antti Suomela over to them for Alex Barabanov. And at the time, it was a pretty innocuous trade, I would say, for the San Jose Sharks, a minor league for minor league player. But obviously, Barabanov has panned out to be like a four 40 to 50 point forward for the Sharks while Suomela is doing absolutely nothing with the Leafs. Could something like that happen with Peterson and Reedy? It's certainly too early to say, but the early returns are looking relatively promising.
When it comes to the third line, I was once again a huge fan of Kevin LeBanc's game. He's been really good for the San Jose Sharks over these past few games. It's, it's definitely been very nice to see. And as usual, Kevin LeBanc will, every once in a while will just contribute with like his amazing shot. I Just a few reviews ago, I talked about how he probably had the best shot out of all the forwards on this team. And I still stand by that a beautiful shot on his first goal a nice play on his second goal so that was great to see Nico Sturm also a very solid game Sveshnikov returns from injury I honestly didn't notice him too too much here tonight so he was a bit of the odd man out I guess when it comes to the fourth line we had Jacob McDonald actually flexing as a forward in this position and I enjoy McDonald significantly more when he is playing the forward position it is not the first time this has happened this season it's like the third or even fourth time that this has happened and when McDonald's on the defensive side of things I'm very nervous he's making way too aggressive plays for the type of player that he is but when he's playing on the forward side he's making those aggressive plays in positions where he can actually afford to do so because he's not expected to be back there defending so I definitely like him a lot more on that particular role and I thought he did a good job of that and I also want to commend Steven Lorenz even though he is playing without his you know best bud uh, Oscar Lindblom over these past couple of games due to injury I have still managed to appreciate Lorenz's performance. Another very good game for him tonight. Zetterland, I thought was decent, but maybe not as standout as the other two players on this line. When it comes to the defensive pairings, we of course have Eric Carlson getting a secondary assist here tonight, putting him up at 96 points through 77 games. Five games remaining for four points, definitely very possible for him. He is on this pairing with Mark Edward Vlasic. And I mentioned uh, when the Sharks acquired... Uh, Eric Carlson that the Carlson Vlasic pairing was a, a big dream for them to actually work out as an amazing one of the best pairings in the league and it never has really worked out like that and honestly it still doesn't seem to be working out that well Carlson and Vlasic even though they've been paired together for much of these last few games I haven't really found it to be all that great Carlson is still managing to cri contribute on the offensive side of things but it feels as though whenever Vlasic is paired with Eric Carlson Vlasic's general level of play just kind of drops. Vlasic had been having a pretty nice resurgent year in the earlier parts of this season, especially when he was paired with Matt Benning, and now over these past few games paired with Eric Carlson, I feel as though he's kind of lagging behind on the defensive side of things. When it comes to the second pairing of Thrun and Shemek, I actually really enjoyed Shemek's game here tonight. I thought he played pretty well, which was definitely nice to see. And then when it comes to Henry Thrun, still certainly pales in comparison to that debut game that he had against the Vegas Golden Knights a couple of games ago, but I still thought he kept it pretty steady, pretty solid. And then we had Matt Benning also returning to the lineup. This is why McDonald ends up playing on that uh, fourth line spot. The Sharks had an excess of defensemen, but not enough forwards to fill in into this particular role. And like I said, McDonald did very well in that particular situation. And Benning, I thought, was decent in his return. And then we have Capo Kakinen. Let's in four goals here tonight and yet still actually had a pretty solid game. The Avalanche, especially early on in this game, probably could have had multiple goals at that point. So even though the Sharks, they would get to regulation with three goals for themselves, certainly not a bad offensive output. This is a game that without Capo Kakinen playing rather solid, the Sharks could have very easily lost 5-3, 6-3. So certainly a very solid performance after an equally solid performance in the previous game against the Arizona Coyotes. But that will do it for this review. The Sharks will be back in action on Thursday where they will take on the Colorado Avalanche again in a bit of deja vu on the schedule. It's a bit of an awkward situation, especially since the Sharks will indeed be the home team once more so it's weird but the sharks will have an opportunity to try and finally get a win against the avalanche this season class dismissed